Good morning, everyone. Today is 11 April, the year 2003. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in California. Part of our mission is to record and preserve the history of World War II. In conjunction with the Veterans Oral History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participate in our country's military conflicts. Today, I'm here at the museum with fellow volunteer Brooke Anderson. Today we have the honor and privilege of interviewing Sergeant Bob Fagason and Captain Jeff Arnett. These gentlemen were both in the CBI, the China Burma India Theater during World War II. So we're going to talk to them about that and a lot of other things. Nice to have you guys here. Thank you. Great to be here. Now, I would like for each of you, and Bob, maybe you can go first, uh, uh, spell your name for us and tell us when and where you were born. Uh, it's Fagelson, F-A-G-E-L-S-O-N. I was born in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, I spent for a good deal of my life there. Uh -huh. And uh, what year? What year were you born there? I was born 16 May 1920. 1920. And Jeff? Spell my name. A-R-N-E-T-T. -E -T. I was born in Los Angeles in 1925. Spent uh, really all my life living here in Southern California. Okay. And what was the date in 1925 you were born? February 16th. February 16th. Okay. Um, sounds like both of you guys grew up during the Depression, so I want each of you to tell me a little bit about that, what that was like for you. Well, in my case, I was fortunate. My father was a very uh, skillful man in, in using his talents and rising up through his business, and we did not, as a family, find ourselves affected by the Depression. I went to public school, and I do remember many of those around me obviously had more dire straits than we did. And my parents always reminded me of how fortunate I was that I wasn't part of that. What kind of work did your dad do? He was the in the retail business and eventually became president of the Bullock's I Magnum store chains out here in California. Oh. I have a next door neighbor who was with Bullock's for years and years and years. And a lot of alums around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so what part of L.A. did you live in then? Pasadena. I'm still in Pasadena oh, right okay. now. Close to the Rose Bowl? I'm within a mile of the Rose Bowl today. We <laughs> just moved from San Marino after 32 years there. And when you were a kid, were you pretty close to the Rose Bowl too? No, I just moved away from the street that I lived on uh, in three houses. I lived in three houses on the same street in San Marino over a period of uh, 60 years. It just got away from that street. <laughs> L.A. was a lot different, obviously, then than it is now. I gave a talk yesterday to a group of ladies, and I said I like to look back because Los Angeles in, the, in those periods was so much more ex open, and the hills were so empty, and you could see from Santa Monica clear into L.A. over the rolling hills. and The neighborhoods were non-threatening. You could go anywhere in town. And you can go up into Altadena, any street in Altadena, turn around, look at Catalina. And you can't do that today. Mm. What high school did you go to? I went to South Pasadena High School. Did you play any sports? I ran in track. I had good success at it. I ran in track. Uh, Bob, and uh, what was it like for you growing up? Uh, I didn't even realize it. My dad was a cattle broker. We had 1,500 acres. And uh, I spent all my summers on on the, uh, not a ranch, but on the farm, and we grew vegetables and uh, that we used. My mother was awful fruit. He, she wasn't cheap. She was awful frugal girl. But uh, if she would say, well, gee, this month I had to borrow money to live on. And what she meant, so she took it out of savings and put it back with interest. I mean, so. <laughs> but that was it. Uh, in high school, I was in junior ROTC. When I got out of high school, I went to Virginia Polytechnic Institute because they said the military would be good for the kid. And uh, that's now Virginia called Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech. That's VPI then, right? Yeah. And uh, but they say I was in military there. I had planned to stay in the service, but I took sick in the CBI on the way home and. Wound up in a hospital at Fort Fort Lawton. By the time I got moved me into the East Coast, 
They said, well, since you're returning you to duty, I said, fine, where am I going? He said, you're going home, you're getting a medical discharge, so. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, you had plenty to eat and everything growing up as a kid, living on a farm, yeah. I suppose, didn't you? Yeah. Did you have brothers and sisters? I have one brother. And, and where in Louisiana was that, that you grew up? No, Alexandria, Virginia. Oh, Virginia, I'm sorry, Alexandria. And you went to a school in Blacksburg. Blacksburg. Right. <laughs> My uh, wife is from a uh, little, well, her family's from a little town called Czech near Roanoke up in the hills. Where? This was called, you would know, Czech and Floyd, but Roanoke was the, the yeah. biggest city. Yeah, you know, that's what I, what have I done? My wife came from Lynchburg. Okay. Yeah, yeah so I've been down in that area a yeah. lot. Yeah. Um, so, what year did you graduate from high school then? Uh, 30, 38, I think. Did you play any sports in school? I was manager of the basketball team. I, not, I'm not athletically inclined. <laughs> okay. um, the, um, did you take ROTC in high school also? Okay. And, and then you went to, uh, to BPI. BPI. And at that time it was kind of a military school? And at that time, there was some 3,100 students, 2,800 were in the cadet corps. I see. If you passed the physical when you went in, you were automatically in the, in the cadet corps. Not, uh, you didn't have any choice. Yeah. So. Uh, Jeff, what year did you graduate from high school? 1943. 43. We're celebrating our 60th anniversary at a party tomorrow night. Yes. Oh, yeah. We're anxious to see. My wife and I were in the same class. Yeah, we're anxious to see who shows up. Right. <laughs> yes. um, do you remember what you were doing on December 7th, 1940? Sure. I was uh, attending a prep school in Claremont, California. And uh, on that Sunday, I was looking out the window at the chapel. And one of the other kids burst into my room and said, they just bombed Pearl Harbor. I can still see myself looking out that window. At that. So you were, how old were you, 15, was, 16, uh, something? Six, 15. So, did that make much of an impression on you, or were you too young? It to did. On, it did on us there because the school immediately went into blackout mode, and the Catalina Island School for Boys obviously had to depart Catalina, <laughs> and moved in with us within two weeks, and it made uh, so that, that period has quite an impression on me. I'm going to pause here for just a second. So. The older kids in the school, did some of them just join the service right away, or, or what? A couple of the seniors did, and interestingly enough, a couple of uh, boys burst into fantasy, I remember, giving us fantastic stories about how when they lived in Paris with their parents, they somehow got to be the youngest guys in the French Air Force, and it was kind of nonsense, you know, <laughs> all proven. Proven <laughs> false, but we at the, the at the Shark Memorial Hospital in San Diego is named after a boy that was in not my class but the class just ahead of me who was killed on Guadalcanal. He, he volunteered. Many of the boys did at the time. Volunteered at very early age, 16 or 17, if they could sneak in when they were 16 to the Marines. And I think they got a lot more than they really imagined. This boy was lost very early in the. But I think most of, the, most of the kids in the school seem to go through the period and, and get home again. Yeah. Bob, do you remember what you were doing on December 7th? Vividly. <laughs> I had gone up, I had, we had finished noon mess, and I had gone up to the what we called the skirt lawn, which was the girls' dormitory, to pick up <laughs> the, the skirt lawn. <laughs> <laughs> we were walking around the drill field. And this freshman comes running up and he stops and he salutes and he says, Sir, he says, Pearl Harbor's been bombed and we're at war. I said, What'd you say, mister? He said, Pearl Harbor's been bombed and we're at war. I said, You've been listening to another Orson Welles program? <laughs> he said, No, sir. And he saluted again and took off. And it didn't make any impression on me. Uh, we walked up about a block to one of the academic buildings and a friend of ours came running out. We called him Teddy Bear. And I said, Teddy Bear, what's the rush? He said, I just came from the Colonel. I said, yeah, what'd you do? He said, nothing. Colonel wouldn't know if I'd change my commission from 
and the aircraft and Air Corps administrator for one year because the Air Corps needed administrative officers. I said, so? He said, well, after I'd signed the papers, he told me we're at war and I'm in the damn Air Corps. <laughs> 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 but with, after the war, I happened to be walking down the street in Washington, D.C., and I see this guy in front of me. And he looked for me. I said, Teddy Bear? And he turned around. He said he had gone on one bombing run so that he could tell his grandchildren that he was on, had been on a bombing run. And you never guess the one he chose. Pulaski. Oh, the fool. Did he get back? He, he was one of the planes that got back. He oh. said he got down on the ground and kissed it. He said, they'll never get me another one. <laughs> <laughs> so when did you go into the service then? Well, I actually enlisted uh, June the 1st. I went on act, active duty April the, uh, of 43. Uh, sure. But I enlisted on June the 1st of 42, but wasn't called to April of 43. And, uh, and you enlisted in the Air Corps? And, well, I was flying in CPT, civilian pilot training at college. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, when I went to, for my physical, and they sent me to an optometrist, and they said, he said, I think you could, uh, could fly. He didn't tell me I had astigmatism in my right eye. And so, but uh, they took me, when I got to uh, Nashville, they washed me out because I had astigmatism. So uh, then what kind of training did you have then after you? Well, once they asked me how much basic training I had, I never had any. But I taught it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had had after seven years in ROTC, right. I, I had knew more about it than most of these 90 day wonders. Mm -hmm. so, but, uh, so where did you go? Where did they uh, transfer you? Or where did you go then? Well, when I washed out, they sent me to Jefferson Barracks. And typically the Army, they asked me what I wanted to do, and I told them uh, A&M training. Which and is? Aircraft for uh, Canada. Okay, and, and Jefferson Barracks is in St. Louis, and, right? And, uh, so they sent me to radio school <coughs> at uh, <laughs> Scott Field. That's when, but I couldn't get code, uh, tone deaf, and uh, <coughs> and I washed. They washed me out and sent me to Truax for radio mechanic. And from that, uh, it was about a 12-week course. In the about the 11th, 10th, or 11th week, if you had an 80 or better grade average, they sent you to either a radar or fighter control. Well, everybody knew what radar was, but nobody knew what fighter control was or where it was. But uh, they, uh, the Army had taken over a Indian reservation in the middle of Wisconsin at Toma. And uh, that's what they, they used. And it was radio, but it was this classified that uh, you went through as a class, and you didn't, uh, could, when you went in class, you couldn't take any notes. If you took notes, you had to leave them there. If you wanted to go to the head, an MP took you to the head and brought you back. You were so secretive. And, and, uh, and uh, they, uh, they said, well, if you went into town on weekend, they say, if anybody asks you what you're doing out there, tell them the truth. You're studying radio. And let it go at that. They, they were all happy then. Uh, Jeff, um, let's, uh, let me ask you, okay, you stayed in high school until you graduated, and then how soon did you go into the service? Well, I had to make my choice on the last day of my 17th year, or other words, the day before my 18th birthday, I went down to the Pacific Electric Station in Los Angeles, and I enlisted, signed up for the Air Cadet Program, and they called me, and manner that uh, I graduated on, forget the actual date in June. I had stayed up all night as you usually do on graduation night, and my present wife was my date. And we went to Union Pacific Station at 2 o'clock the next afternoon and lined up with 
quite a few other guys on our way to Kern, Utah, and the sergeant assured all of our parents he was going to take good care of us. <laughs> Which brought a lot of laughs from all the family. And we went through basic infantry training for some time, and then got into the uh, CTD programs and college training detachments. Being just high school graduates, they wanted to bring us up to date, and they did so on, on physics and mathematics and uh, geography and that sort of thing. Had you always had an interest in flying? Quite. I was telling somebody the other night that I used to dig the holes in the backyard that were like cockpits of open cockpit airplanes. And I had tin can lids in there. So I, I could, hell, I, I had more flying hours by the time I was 12 <laughs> than most people did. And uh, I followed the exploits of uh, Roscoe Turner and Jimmy Doolittle and, and uh, had the great experience in, uh, in my later life of knowing Jimmy Doolittle very well. And did going to lunches where they, I actually had him fly in your position. <laughs> sitting in my co-pilot one day. Uh, <laughs> yeah. wow. quite, so yes, I, I really was fixated on, on aviation. We happened to live in Pasadena on the route that the airliners used to go to Grand Central, which then was the western terminal for all airlines. And they come in in the worst looking weather and right down on your house. And uh, I never failed to look up. I still look up. I can't, I can't, I can't help myself. Mm. So you went to Utah for your... First. That was basic training with the Santa Ana for free pre-flight where they separated you. If, they, if you got through it all, you went to pilot or navigator or bombardier. And then I went to Oxnard, California, uh, right near Ventura for a primary. And I went to Lamore, California, which is now a naval base for basic. And took, uh, we switched in the middle of basic to twin engine, getting accelerated by that time. And I was to go to La Hunta, Colorado and fly B-25s in and the night we were to leave, they lined us up for the train and they said, gentlemen, there are ten too many of you going to Lahada, so will the following please step out? So all the Andersons and the Arnett's and the Ameses and people like that that I knew for years later on, we went to a advanced school in New Mexico and found ourselves standing on the platform when we arrived. We looked up at the new aircraft we were going to be faced with and it was just what we had been flying in basic. So, War, the thing was over. All we had to do was learn instruments. Oh. And we all jumped around, hugged each other. <laughs> <laughs> what were some of the uh, training tra trainers that you flew? Well, we flew the uh, BT, the Velt Vibrator, the Stearman. I own the Stearman today. I flew it this yeah. morning. Yeah, I flew yeah. it this morning down here at uh, Bermuda oh, Downs. Yeah. And the AT, the Bobcat, the Cessna Bobcat, was a funny looking twin engine thing. And I went from that into uh, troop carrier. I was determined to be an airline pilot and I knew you got a lot more time flying around in a slow airplane than you did flying around in a fighter. And I don't think I'm of nature to be a fighter pilot anyway. So I, I got what I wanted and got all the way through and was, was sent to India as a result to fly transports. Fly C-47s? C-47s and C-46 later. Yeah. Okay, tell me the difference between a 40 C-47 and a C-46, and which did you like? A 47 first? is uh, very easy to fly. It's, it's, a, it's a sweetheart. You can fly itself. <clears throat> yeah, anybody can fly that thing. It has a little, when you first learn it, it has a little bounce problem, which is kind of funny to watch when people get into it, but it's uh, a very comfortable plane to fly. The C-46 is much larger. It's the largest twin-engine land plane they built. They have built so far. To me, it was like flying around this room, and I never really felt a part of the C-46. Uh, not everybody shared that thought with me, but we, I flew it for uh, probably 700 hours, so I, I got away with it. But I preferred the DC-3 to the C-47. And so you got to, in, where in India did you first go? Flew out of Dinjan in Upper Assam, India. Okay, so how did you get there? What's, what's the route? I took my own plane. Now, there, there's a book called uh, Flight to Everywhere, which details of flights across the North Atlantic and the South Atlantic to, to supply India, which covers that route very nicely. And I went down through Puerto Rico to British Guiana to Belém, Brazil, to Natal, Brazil. I left Natal at 11 o'clock at night for Ascension Island, having just celebrated my 20th birthday. To give you an idea how young with a navigator, a professional navigator on board. We went from Ascension to the Gold Coast, up through Maiduguri, Nigeria, and across to El Fasher in the Sudan, and then 
Karachi, Aden, or Karachi first, and then Aden, and Rasera Island at the entrance to the Persian Gulf, and then Karachi, and then across to Bamo, Burma, right below where you were. Oh, Bamo. Bamo. Oh, Bamo. 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 <coughs> yeah. And then up to Dinjan, and from when the, my first few months were in Burma, stationed at Dinjan, and we were sent down into Burma every morning with a drop load or something of that kind, and then spent the rest of the day hopping around and doing what guys like Bob and, and others said we could help them doing it. So now, okay, so what was the date you got over there then? I got over there, I'd say, about the 12th of March. Of uh, 44? 45. 45. Okay. It was supposed to take, I think, 14 days to get there, and I took three and a half weeks because partway over I realized they weren't expecting me anywhere. They would, they would gas the plane up, but they weren't in any hurry to see me. <laughs> and what uh, what outfit were you in there? I ended up in the 11th Combat Cargo. Okay, Bob, um, tell me how you got over overseas. <clears throat> how did that all? Uh, <clears throat> where did you I, end up? When I graduated from a CNS school, Control Net System, I got a 10 day delay in route to report to Goldsboro, North Carolina uh, for, for departure. I went from there to, they closed it down and sent me to Greensboro, North Carolina. And then they sent us out. And uh, we went to Patrick Henry, Camp Patrick Henry. We took a ship out of there and went down Coast to here, through the Caribbean, through the Panama Canal, uh, southwest to uh, the Cook Straits between North and South Island, uh, New Zealand, uh, North and Tasmania, the Tasmanian Sea, and docked at Fremantle. And we stayed there two days. And then uh, from Fremantle, we, they gave us a, uh, I think it was a, or the British cruiser was going to escort us up to uh, Bombay. And uh, we were out there one day and the skipper told him, said, look, you're too slow for us, we're going on our own. Well, we took off and <laughs> the next day that cruiser was sunk. Oh, wow. <laughs> so we landed in Bombay and we were there about, oh, uh, one interesting thing. They called me in the orbit room one day at, Call this number. I said, what is it? He said, I don't know, it's a number in Bombay. I said, I don't know anybody in Bombay. But I called, it was the Red Cross telling me my oldest daughter, child, was born the day I walked out of gangplank in Bombay. Oh. So, uh, <laughs> That's neat. But uh, when we were shipped east, it took four days and three nights to go maybe 1,500 miles. I mean, and that was the Calcutta Express. <laughs> so when they gave us our orders for the British transportation officer, he said, here's your orders. This is your compartment. There were six of us, seven of us. He said, when you pull into a station, lock the door, the windows, don't let anybody in. If anybody asks you how many in here, tell me 27. And I don't know where they would have put the others if they had put them in there. And, uh, I looked at, they said, where are we going? I looked at it and said, Horace Station. I didn't know where Horace Station was, but I knew this was the Calcutta Express. I said, I'm going to Calcutta. If I'm going too far, they'll send me back. But Hara is the suburb of Calcutta, and that's where it is. And when we got there, they picked us up in the sixth line and took us to Dum Dum Orphanage. The Army had taken over this orphanage at Dum Dum Airport to a, as an R&R, &R. and that was the most miserable place. You ate with one hand and, <laughs> and shoot flies with the other. <laughs> and uh, I said, heck, do you get out of here? Well, this one, one marauder, he had put up there, he said, are you over here to do with the Chinese? I said, I don't know well, who you'll be with. He said, well, if you're with the Chinese, you do one thing, you shoot yourself. Because they're going to shoot you sooner or later, anyhow. <laughs> and, uh, but I said, how do you get out? He said, well, you can either take a riverboat up to the Irrawaddy, which is about two weeks. You can take a train, which is about two weeks. 
Well, if you're lucky, you can fly. It takes about three hours. I said, I'm flying. Mm -hmm. So my orders, or the orders for the those that said that first available air, but as Jeff would tell you, over there, that didn't mean it. If they needed a box of paper clips, more than they needed a colonel. <laughs> the colonel gave the seat up. <laughs> and, uh, what seat? <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, we finally had some argument. This uh, transportation sergeant, and why I tell you what, he said, if you're here at 0600, uh, I'll put three of you on one, and then four on the next one, flying into Chabawa. So uh, I said, I'll be here. So we were there, and we got to Chabawa, and then when all seven of us got there, we called the squadron and told them where we were. They said, we're waiting for you. We'll send a vehicle. So a vehicle came. We went up there, and I gave him my orders, and he said, uh, where's the equipment? And we looked at each other, what equipment? He said, you men are supposed to be train guards bringing the equipment up. They said, nobody told us. They told us to be here, and here we are. The, the equipment was about a week and a half later. <laughs> I want to back up just a little bit. Um, explain to me then what uh, an air control command was all about. Fighter control. The fighter control. It's somewhat hard to explain. Every pilot, and most of them didn't even know they had it. Uh, and Jeff will tell you he has a call thing of, of what they each airstrip had a homing station. Uh, up in the mountain you had DF station for triangulization, which was radioed back to a control room. And it, it was like a in fact I think it was what saved England during the Battle of Britain. Because they didn't have to fly aircraft around looking. They knew when the raids were coming in and uh, they could vector them right there. Uh, my main job was bringing in lost aircraft from, from China, or when I had to brand, bringing them back from, uh, from drop missions. And, and what, uh, when did, what year and, and what month did you get over there then, or to uh, your I, duty station? I landed in, uh, <laughs> remember it well, I landed in uh, Bombay uh, July the 6th of 44. Oh, July 6th, uh, yeah. And uh, so, uh, let, Jeff, Jeff let's, let's, I'm going to ask you a little bit now. Um, you were a troop carrier pilot, and you guys... I was trained as troop carrier, and most of my fellow trainees did go to England. Oh, uh -huh. and they're a little late for the, the invasion itself, because we finished our training in September of 44. Uh-huh. But uh, why I got... Uh, off on the, on the China thing, I don't know, but it was a, a very adventurous thing and much preferable, as far as I'm concerned, to flying around uh, dropping paratroopers on training missions and then maybe going into Europe. But for somebody who wanted to be a pilot and wanted to be tested, the flying in the jungles of Burma and on very temporary setups, maybe a, a rice paddy dried three days ago, or a road scraped out a little bit across the field, or a, the river's down low so you can land on that sandbar out there. That it, uh, you couldn't, I, I flew 250 seat, 250 hours in the right seat with experienced guys before I went over on the left seat and it was a real show as far as getting trained. And I, I use it today or did flying to Baja California for many years on those funny little strips down there. It was, so were you taking troops in or taking supplies Taking or what? supplies in. We took in ammunition and gasoline and occasionally personnel. Uh, we were supplying the British. We okay, now by this time Wingate had probably been yeah, they killed. Were gone. He they was were gone. Wingate had died. Yeah, yeah he's been killed. And, and uh, they, were, they were pushing, the Japanese were backing up very fast. It was south of Mission on down by Pahu. The air, the danger from fighters, uh, I think three weeks before I arrived, there were nine of my type aircraft shot down in Pahu. Japanese. In one, they were all circling the land and were rather complacent, I guess. They really got shot up. And I was a replacement for some of those people. But every day was very interesting in flying uh, now, did crazy you places. Now, did you get involved in flying over the hump? 
Oh yes. Okay. <clears throat> Tell me about that. We the we checked, we left so. it. We were based in Denjan, India, and then after about three months in Burma, we were transferred to Yunnan, China, Yunnan Yi, which was on the Burma Road, and it was about a 125 miles west of Kunming, up in the mountains. So we were literally on the hump. And we flew back and forth. We went east to Kunming and we went west to Dinjian. And I really don't remember uh, what our what our loads were, but the weather didn't matter. I mean, if you were supposed to I could be taken off a UNAND on a gravel strip on a foggy morning and they had like like they were doing a football field, they'd run a line thing down the white line so you could take off and follow that to get off the ground. I mean, the weather was not, not to be any deterrent at all, and you learned your instruments pretty well. You got tested every day and that sort of thing. We did go to, uh, we moved the Chinese First Army after the war from around Mishinaw to Peking. Uh, the uh, Comcar groups, combat cargo groups did that. We didn't realize we were really setting them up to fight Mao, but that's what was during the war, we flew all over China. If you look at a map of China, they said this was all the occupied area by Japan. All they had was the railroad and the roads. In between, yeah, it was the unoccupied. River, the river. And the river. It was and unoccupied. Now, in that. <laughs> so we could fly all kinds of places. And the, the fighter control, I got in trouble twice and hit what we called A channel or B channel. We just hit a channel button and started yelling saying we'd seen some fighters down here, maybe they hadn't seen us yet against the mountains. And it would be three or four minutes, there'd be a couple of 38s or something go by us, you know, where are they, where are they looking, are they looking for these? And it would be this guy, I surprised, we just met today, we just met today, and I've, and I've concluded we've actually probably spoken to each other in the same area. But fighter, the fighter channel, we weren't afraid to hit that at all, we hit that thing, because our armament was a submachine gun behind my seat. <laughs> <laughs> but we got a wonderful uh, flying education. We, of course, I think supplied some very important things to people. And we'd, you'd put ammunition on the floor of the plane, or you'd give about 25 or 30 50 gallon drums of gasoline back there. And then we'd say, okay, boys, no smoking, right? So we hear, you know, <laughs> How many drums? I forget. We had more in the 46 than you did in the, I think it was 25 or 30. Yeah, that's bad. You had 50 in a C 46. Bob, um, at the base, I mean, where you were stationed, was that a fighter base? Uh, well, the first one at Moran, it, uh, they had a squadron of the 490th medium bombers, 25s. Uh, they had a group of uh, P-47s and a couple of uh, combat cargo squadrons. Of course, at the uh, at, uh, now it was it was a bigger strip, and you had everything uh, there. P fifty ones and they, they had, where you had the four, uh, 40 fortieth tactical reconnaissance squadron. Uh, we had a couple of uh, combat cargo or troop carrier there. Uh, we had a ATC flying in and out of there. That's the army of terrified civilians. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All, always taking credit. Always taking credit. Allergic to combat. Yeah, all kinds of things. They were actually, they were actually airline people and extremely talented. But unfortunately, they were under severe control, and uh, we were not. <laughs> they they led the charge over there, forty two and forty two. We called them the Army of Terrified <laughs> What do you have there, Jeff? Well, I was just looking up. He spoke about Moran being at Moran, and I told him today what his frequency were. Oh. Were at Moran. And you asked me about another. Oh, he said to me he was at North Mission. And he says, that's Yoke Ogo. And I didn't remember that. But I looked it up in this little handwritten thing I carried or had for all these years. And Mission on North, where he was, was Yoke Ogo. That was the that's call something. Sign. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What is that book, Jeff? And it was, that was a little handbook that's, that I wrote down to get book. myself <laughs> around Burma. Okay. Yeah. It was just, a, you didn't get anything official. Mm -hmm. You learned it from the other, you sat it, in the right seat and learned it from this guy. It, it, he it, was B channel. I remember it, I mentioned channel. You push mm -hmm. a channel button like you do today, like a telephone. That was new then. Used to, all the radios were these things you did like this and squeaky back and forth. Mm -hmm. The channel was preset. 
You're 522. You were beach in it, whether you remember that or not. 522. 522? Well, this yes, is. That would be our, our SCS uh, radio that was in all the planes. Oh. And, and his beacon was uh, 235. <laughs> that, that's, that's amazing. I never thought I'd use that again. That's just wonderful. Uh -huh. Yankee Hobo. Yankee, Hobo. Yankee no, Yoke Yo 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 Hobo. Yoke Hobo. Yankee today, but it's Yoke Hobo. Quite, uh, quite primitive over there, wasn't it? it, uh, it uh, it's like I, tell, I think I was talking with you, mm -hmm. that uh, they say, do this. Well, how do I do it? I don't care how you do it, do it. And uh, you can do it the best way you can. Maybe you had to borrow something from somebody or, or trade something from somebody or even steal it. <laughs> but you got the job done. And uh, because it wasn't a question of, gee, we'll wire back and they'll send it over to us. Uh, like he said, they are. Uh, the best thing was to have a plane crack up, because that gave you small spare parts for the next one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there was a strip called Mong Mit, and you approached it over a bluff on the river, not the main river, and you could not go around. If you, if you didn't land, you had no choice but to ground the, the airplane. And we're talking about a DC-3 or C-47. There were 12 of them on that strip lying around in various positions where guys came in too far, too fast, couldn't stop and spun around to keep from hitting the wall at the end. <laughs> and that was used for, for spare parts. One thing we did in Burma, which everybody appreciated, we came down at something like 12 or 13,000 feet. Now Burma is very hot, and very uncomfortable, and these troops are not feeling, they don't like it down there, you know. I got a ration, though I didn't drink beer, I didn't drink any liquor, Sometimes we got extra beer rations. It was just a kid. Put them, <laughs> put them in the plane. By the time I got down there in the morning, by the time I got down there after being at 13,000 feet for three or four hours, it was cold. And it got so that our planes, we, we turned around and, and, and parked to unload the load. The guys were in there looking for a beer. <laughs> <laughs> or you get or a, a coke. Or you get a yeah. tub of gasoline and stick an air hose in it. And the evaporation of the gas oh, yeah. would suck the heat out of the can. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Did you have fighter escort when you your mission? Sure. Only well, if we asked for it. Uh, if we asked for it, it was very prompt. I only asked uh, three times, I think. And that would be when? We'd spot a fighter. That's right. Maybe That's he hadn't so, yeah. seen us. We were mm -hmm. down low, usually. Going through Burma, your, the trees are about 100 feet high. And you try to, if you're looking for somebody, you've got to notice first, if you look at the map, the squeeze of the land has made the Solween River and the others in can very definite canyons, like a, like a farm furrow out in the field from uh, east to west. And these rivers, are canyons are quite deep and narrow, and you can go down the wrong one looking for some outfit. You had a Selwyn, a Chittawin. Well, they were all just kind of... They, but they, they look like green rugs, you know, with big furrows in them. Mm -hmm. And we went down the wrong one one day, down very low, and all of a sudden into our view comes a stockade of some kind. And we kind of looked at each other, and before we could finish looking, we were flying by it, and the Japanese flag was waving on the, on the pole above it. And they were all just looking at us. <laughs> we surprised them, they surprised <laughs> right. us. We had, we had a DF station on top of the mountain above a... Tinkock. Tinkock's a can? can. And See what that frequency was. They, they, uh, <laughs> they had, that were up there, and the Japanese were down in Tinkock. And what they had, they had a detachment of Gurkhas to protect them. Tough guys. Yeah. I tell you, I'll stack a Gurkha up against any troops in the, in the world. That's what I've heard. Yeah. In fact, I had, I had two Turkeries. Gurkhanized. Did you really? Yeah. And I gave like, this face, well, they were given to me by the commanding general of the uh, Nepalese army. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm getting rid of that stuff. I asked my son, I said, Gene, you want one? He said, yeah. I said, take whichever one you want. But I want one to use when I go to talk to these groups. Yeah. And I won't let them take it out of the case. Because they are, they are you can shave with them, I tell you. Mm -hmm. Sure, they were. 
the Gurkhas are, they aren't big, but they aren't tough. So what exactly was your job there at the at, at those bases? Telling this guy how to, where he was. <laughs> we he would, by him. voice, by voice? Or, you know, by even, voice. And what range, how? how <clears throat> well, uh, and I, I'm going to brag a little bit now. When we were at Michinau, 98% of our calls came from zero to 90 degrees. And when 90 degrees, we could okay, get out. What, what does that mean? Huh? What does that mean? It covers, the, the, covers the entrance and exit from the home. Is that about right? Yeah. The western exit of oh, okay. the uh, uh, due, due north would have been zero, and 90 degrees would be due east. Okay. But uh, we, we got so good. We know that with mountains, we can only hear so far. If the, their voice had begun to fade, then we knew exactly. And we could come within 10 miles how far out they were. In fact, we got so good once that towards the end of the war, so everybody would have something to do, the radar, the control room would get the radar, and then they'd call us to verify what the radar said. <laughs> right there. And normally the pilots would be lost because of weather or something like that? Weather. Did, were you there? Don't, don't they have monsoon seasons in those? Oh, yes. What was that? <laughs> Mon, <the> mon <laughs> That's raindrops the size of your thumb. <laughs> that you can't then see you across get, the distance like this room. That you can get from two to three hundred inches a, a year in six months. And the other six months, you don't see drop one. I used to homer once because what she was because I fell asleep. I was flying at 2.30 in the morning from Luliang, China, <coughs> down towards Nanning, China, which gets you pretty close to uh, Indochina. And I thought my co-pilot was awake. So I slid down in my seat like that, and I had the plane on autopilot, and I was looking at the ADF. And I suddenly woke up, and he, he was asleep. I, I woke up, looked at the ADF, Okay, what's an, what, what's an ADF? Well, it's a, a pointing to a radio that you've set. You want to cross a certain point down there, and the needle was pointing there. So I dozed off again. I woke up five minutes later. We should have been past that. And it was still, so I did a, a 360 turn, and the needle stayed right where it was. <laughs> <laughs> All the way around. <laughs> it means it wasn't working one bit. The sun was coming up, and I looked down, and I saw a... Uh, thing that I knew to be a Japanese air base. And that's when I hit a channel and called fighter control and told them where I thought I was and I was going to Nanning. They gave me a heading right away and we had a couple of P-38s show up in about eight minutes or so uh, looking for the bad guys who never moved. They didn't move. They didn't move a muscle. They didn't, they didn't think it was healthy. They didn't move a muscle. I remember calling you guys. Maybe it was you. But uh, I, uh, what a story. Plane took off from Chongqing at midnight. Now, about four and a half hours, he was approaching Chabur, Dinjan, yeah. Moenbury, Mucklebury, Nagaguli, one of those bases. And uh, he, could, he didn't find anything thing that looked familiar. So finally he saw a hole in the clouds. He said, well, I'll drop down and see what I can find. He dropped down, and he was over a big lake. Tally. Red Tally. Yeah, he had been flying all night long and hadn't gone and anywhere. Any progress, <laughs> his headwind was the equal So strong he hadn't gone anywhere. <laughs> I think that story's in the, uh, from the uh, clouds uh, volume, yeah. That's got some great stories. <laughs> so, both you guys go around to talk to groups about your experiences? I do. I, I've, I've got a, a setup. I have a, off that book, Flight to Everywhere, I have a, I have a talk that I call, uh, what is it? Uh, you Gotta Be Kidding. With my co pilot, Victor Cole from North Carolina, Sanford, North Carolina. Anytime something happened, he said, You gotta be kidding. 
<laughs> that was everywhere. I, I've got this 40-minute talk that I give to breakfast groups and so on. It's, I've got some slides together. It's fun to share it with them. We, I think they really appreciate it. We had a bunch of humpers over the house one night, just sitting there shooting back and forth. And this one hadn't said a word. And he did that. And said, George, why aren't you talking? He said, I don't talk about it. I said, well, you've got to talk about it because the big thing, if you don't talk about it, it bottles up in you. And the bad stuff gets more festering. Uh, and on top of that, if you don't talk about it, nobody will ever know. He said, yeah, but they wouldn't believe you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, and th this is something. There was a rumor that went around we were over there that if you screw up one more time, fella, you'll find yourself in the CBI. And yeah, that was. I, you know, you take it with a grain of salt when you're over there. Like going when to I the Eastern Front. In the, Eighth, yeah. in the Eighth Air Force, he said that was the truth. You, you uh, have engine trouble one more on a raid to Berlin, you'll find yourself in the CBI. Hmm. I had some unique, two unique experiences over there. Our squadron was selected for several special missions, and my commanding officer, Frank Haney, Major Haney, would often take, he'd take me off whatever I was doing and I'd go with him as his co-pilot. And one was the opening of Shanghai. Uh, we landed, we flew over the city and dropped leaflets, and I have one here, I think, uh, yeah, from Wiedemar. Leaflets addressed to detainees or internees. And we flew over the city of Shanghai, and then we landed at the old base, the, the main airport was bombed out. And we landed at the field at the Pan-American clippers used to come up out of the river park. It was big enough to land on. And we were bringing with us Navy medical relief teams, which is why I mean, we picked them up in Chongqing. And the Japanese met us. We landed there, and they met us at rifle point, the squadron. Here, here's the enemy. You walk out of, look out of the plane, here's the enemy with the rifles on us. And there was a, a problem for a while. They called the Swiss consul in Shanghai who came out. This was at the time that Emperor Hirohito, they were trying to kidnap him to keep the war going. You remember reading that? The army didn't want to quit. Mm -hmm. And uh, the emperor was trying to tell everybody to quit. And uh, we got into the Swiss consul and spent the night there. And in the morning, everything was, the war was over and everything was done. And then we also got a mission a few days later to fly the first Chinese into Formosa, which is now Taiwan. We did the same thing there. We flew in. And we were the first. Uh, six planes went in. And that was the two unique experiences yes. that I remember so, so very well. They got to all go along with the majors. They seemed to like me as a co-pilot. So. Yeah. It was fun. I have a, a coffee table made, uh, made out of teak wood, or mahogany, I think, and three uh, tier tables that came out of the last plane to, to leave uh, Shanghai before the communists took over. Before they took over. Oh, really? oh. So, Bob, uh, when did you depart uh, from that theater there? Uh, we got orders for ZI in August of 45. And every base they had put us at, we were the first ones there. So they'd issue us kitchen equipment and they figured, why take it back in? We'll just bring the others through. So we finally got into Karachi. Karachi. And uh, we were sat there, and there were plane troops going out. So the whole squad was mutiny. And we went up to, we went, when we going? We had ZI orders back in August. So, you know, not being having points, married with a child, had some weight theoretically, and uh, they went up and they were talking to this colonel, and I said, Colonel, I says, what are you doing with this report? He says, well, I'll go back to Delhi and give it to the general. I said, then hell, send the general down here. We don't need you. <laughs> I, I always was a, even milita in military school, I walked more tours. <laughs> in fact, I, I chewed out a colonel once. And what I got for it was a commendation. <laughs> Tell me about that. Uh, 
Well, this the plane called in for a bearing, and I gave it to him. And the procedure was, see, we use ANCOC antennas, and they were funnel shaped, so that you had every three or four minutes you'd give him a corrective bearing to bring him down that funnel. And uh, I asked him two or three minutes, I said, do you request another QDM? He said, say again. I said, do you request another Queen Dog Mike? He said, I don't understand. Explain. I said, ask your radio operator. He said, suppose I don't have a radio operator. I said, well, you should have gotten your cue signal before you left the ground. He said, I neglected to do so. Explain. I said, I don't explain nothing. Over and out. <laughs> a week later, there was a knock on the unit door. And I opened it. I happened to be on duty again. And I had opened it. And there was a major stand in there. He said, may I come in? Well, I could have said no, but I'll come out. But we had classified equipment. And, uh, but I said, yeah, Major, come on in. And you were a sergeant at the time? I was. <laughs> and uh, finally, it's, uh, he came in and looked around. And he said, who was on duty and whatever the date was? And I had written it in my law book, so. And uh, I said, I was, why? He said, you were upon a plane coming in, and you uh, refused to give him a queen gun uh, or a kind of secure signal? I said, well, I said, yes. I said, he said, that was Colonel so-and-so. He was the commanding officer of the uh, fighter group there. I said, well, I figured it's had to hit the fire. <laughs> and I said, if you'll convey my apologies to the colonel, I said, I wasn't about to give Q signals in clear text over the air. He said, no, no, sorry. I said, don't mix them. He said, Colonel appreciated that. And he said, yeah. And then, uh, about a month later, we get a commendation from the general, commanding general of Northern Air Command in Burma. And not from our squadron, but from that colonel that he had written us up for a commendation. Yeah, it is here. Jeff, when did you, uh, how long did you stay over there? You say you stayed there a bit after I stayed till uh, December the 2nd. And I came home on a, a Navy carrier to Catachon Bay. It took 16 days and got into Los Angeles on December 23rd. I had a rather... What was the name of that carrier? Got in on Catachon Bay. I came in on December 23, 1945. I had a rather charmed life in the service in the sense that I came home I got home for every Christmas and New Year's without trying. I just ended up at home. <laughs> uh, I left for overseas. I said I went to the Rose Bowl game January 1st, 1945. I got on a plane and went to Fort Wayne, Indiana. I picked up a new plane and took it overseas. And I docked in Los Angeles having gone around the world. I'd never gone back the other way. So I went right around the world. We docked on December 23rd. And I called up my dad. Pasadena, he drove down and picked me up. Now that was a pretty tough life. Wow. So, <laughs> never, and all the people with me were from Kansas or Massachusetts or something, yeah. so it wasn't happening to them. Yeah. He got over there after I did, and he was home six well, months Well, before me over. Yeah. <laughs> Would have been earlier yet, obviously. We could go home when we got 800 hours overseas. And we were flying 150 hours a month yeah. or more. Once we had 150 hours on the 10th of the month. Now that's pretty banging it in there. But everybody tried to jam these hours in so you could go home. I want to tell a little story. Uh, the ready board up the order room. Yeah. This pilot, he ran down, he got it, and then he comes over here. He turns his, forget thing. He says, what shape is she in? She said, not too bad a shape. She says, it's hard to synchronize the props. One of them has a nick out in it. He said, and, and watch it when you let your wheels down. Make sure they lock down. He said, sometimes they you. <laughs> and he said, and they, you know, they were flying planes that CAA wouldn't have let you taxi them to the yeah. hangar. Yeah. <clears throat> and I was flying with them. And the 
pilot, I was standing between the pilot and co-pilot. He said, give me some wobble. And I reached down and grabbed the first hand like that. Flap hand. <laughs> and the wheels. Oh, the wheels. <laughs> and I stopped. <laughs> hey, wait, wait, wait. Because <laughs> they were about that far apart. And they're right down there. <laughs> and I just reached down and grabbed the first one I could do. <laughs> All in a day's work. All yeah. in a day's work. We did some funny things. That we, we were in China and told to go get a new airplane in Agra, India. And again, the CO and I, you know, he was picking on me, we went over to India. From We went to, to Agra, India, where the Taj Mahal is. I'm the only mm -hmm. guy in the squadron who has seen the Taj Mahal. Mm -hmm. And in the morning, they said, well, your, your new plane's out there down the line number so-and-so. Well, we got down there and it was a C-46 and we'd never climbed up the ladder of a C-46, much less started one or flown it. But you weren't going to tell anybody that, you know, so <laughs> you couldn't fly it. But so I remember we figured out how to get into it and we had a crew chief with us and we started the plane up looking at the book, how do you get it started, and this sort of thing. Kind of checked ourselves out and flew it over the hump to China. <laughs> may, may, Jeff, you may verify this. When the first 46s came over, there were a lot of bugs there. In fact, the 29s that came over were full of bugs. They used to send them to the CBI to check them out. But the tendency of the 46, if you, if you lost an engine and try and bank, get your parachute going. But it tended to burn, too. Yeah, they had a gasoline heater right behind me, and it was fed by fuel. Mm -hmm. and it was sometimes go talk there. And it also had electric propellers, which we have on our P-40 down here, but it had electric props as well, and they would go haywire. I was told also that they had cargo doors on each side of the plane. I don't remember each side, but we used them on one side. Well, I, 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 they, they did, and that, which meant it was pretty, made the tail pretty unstable. I mean, it was pretty... I just didn't like it. I flew it a lot, but I didn't like it. It was handy in one respect. We had a colonel that we didn't care for in Kunme. <laughs> it was some miles from us, but he, he had a bad reputation, and one night they were really going to fix him good. So they went over in the middle of the night with us while we were moving to Shanghai. So one of the planes going to Shanghai went over to Kunme. They were waiting for him over there in the middle of the night, and the colonel had a staff car, one of these bulbous looking Plymouths of the time, you know, the big bulb yeah. defender. They'd taken the fenders off, and they drove the thing up into the C-46, and they flew it to Shanghai. Now, there's no road. You can't drive from Shanghai to <laughs> You can today, but it was quite a few hundred miles. They unloaded the plane there, drove it downtown Shanghai with the fenders back on, parked it in front of the Park Hotel, which was 10th uh, Air Force headquarters, or Army headquarters, and left it there. Now, it had all the numbers on it and everything else in the city for a guy way up in Kunming. And we always laughed, wondering, what do you suppose they thought about that car? <laughs> when the war was over, all these troops were over there, and they had a little colonel named Peacock. Little bit of colonel. Huh? Just, just about, I think he must have been five, six. Oh, do a little size. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> He, he, he said that there's nothing they could do to get basic training again. He's got to been in, in combat for two oh. years, he was given basic training. He got this plane once, and the, the parachute didn't seem to fit right, so he went to pick up to get it right. They were like somebody had really did to do this. <laughs> <laughs> We got a couple minutes to go here on our tape. Um, tell me a little bit. What are you guys doing now? And uh, these days, where do you live? And uh, I, live, uh, no, I live in uh, Nacogdoches, Texas. You should know about it now. That's where the letters shuttle. Find and parts of the shuttle. Oh, that's, that's right. Yeah. yeah, I did hear about that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, my big big deal is going around talking to schools and service clubs back to CBI. Uh, back in 85, I, uh, I find when they get over 20, they're more receptive. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. We've been more of that, I don't know. Yeah. 
It depends. Since Some are. Yeah. My daughter, Tia, is a bilingual teacher. Mm -hmm. And she had me come to her class. And, I, and he, she was in conjunction with the next class. And he was a, uh, a Mexican who were, went to, I think he was a mechanical engineer. He was teaching school. And I'm talking to these kids, and, and they just sitting there. And I said, Carlos, you know what the, they understand? He said, I don't know. And I'm talking about the St. Elmo's fire. You got to see it to believe it. Yeah. And he looked at, he said, he didn't know what it was. You know what St. Elmo's fire is? No, no, exactly. Mm -hmm. You see it on the airliner. If you look out, you see a little oh, yeah, right. mm -hmm. okay. blue mm -hmm. thing yep. out there. Mm -hmm. I remember one guy, the coach pilot said, Will you quit tricking my ear. What do you mean then? <laughs> it was jumping from the top of the cockpit down on the <laughs> And Jeff, do you live here part time and part time in? The, I have a home here at, uh, at uh, PGA West, and I'm out here most Thursdays to Mondays. Mm -hmm. I'm in the tail end of a financial career, and I spend a couple mornings a week in town trying and to pull vol plants up out of the water. <laughs> volunteer here at the Air Museum. I come here at the Air Museum on Friday afternoon. Sure, you enjoy that. In the army hangar, are you? Or I'm in the army hangar. Sure, been nice to have you guys here. Thank Dave, could I get one quick yes, question? Yes, go ahead. Some tape go, yeah. could, could you explain to us about the blood chit? We started well, talking about that before the tape went on. I don't know why it's called the blood chit. I forgot. I, yeah. I, I, have, I have read. Yeah. This is a made of buffalo hide, and it's one I bought in India. It's, it's the real McCoy, and I, as I said, wore it on the inside of my jacket rather than the outside. 